Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we talk fossils, those bones in the ground. How did they get there and how do we get them out again? Plus, our guest Dan Schreiber asks Dave how to source a dinosaur fossil ethically. Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards. This week um, I'm here with Dave Hone who is slightly frustrated. Now the drama of making this podcast the drama! Um, we got let down by modern technology so this is our second attempt at recording this. Are you alright Dave? Are you going to be okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm slightly worried by you opening with this week I'm with Dave Hone which makes me wonder who else you've been recording dinosaur podcasts with. I haven't been cheating on you, <laughs> I swear. I swear. Well, um, well because every week we have a different guest but you're not that guest and then I was like oh we don't announce the guest until just before even though they just heard it in the pre-tro it's very complicated it really is very complicated this week what I thought we should talk about because we haven't really talked about we've talked about dinosaurs we talked a bit about their behavior and that sort of thing what we haven't talked about is how we know about dinosaurs and that is fossils. Now, I'm aware that there are different types of fossils because there are the types which are bones, that sort of thing, and then there are things like footprints, so yes. which don't count as fossils or are fossils. I get confused. They are. So, yeah, so we, we basically have two broad classifications of fossils. And the first are body fossils, which are, yeah, bones and teeth and shells when it comes to other kind of animals like that, um, and uh, anything directly attached to that, which is the, the original animal that has preserved so occasionally that means things like muscle and scale those are all body fossils and then we have things that we call trace fossils and those are remnants of where animals were or things that they did so footprints nests eggs anything oh, eggs, like eggs that. should be bodies because eggs are yeah, like I, 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 I sound very pro um pro uh, life american pro egg. <laughs> yeah um, it, well, so, I mean, you get these weird combinations. So, like, if you've got an egg which has an embryo in it, then that's sort of simultaneously a trace fossil and a body fossil. And if you have a bone with a bite mark on it, the bone is clearly a body fossil, but the bite is a trace fossil. Ah. So they're, they're not, yeah, they're, they're not 100% separated. But fundamentally, yeah, we talk about body fossils and we talk about traces. And, of course, most people are used to thinking about body fossils. They may have considered footprints. But, yeah, we, we have these whole groups of different fossils, and all of them are ultimate some kind of record of past life. But if we talk about body fossils for a moment, because I'm, I'm going to admit this, and it makes me sound a little dim. I was a teenager before I realised that it's not that a fossil bone is not the same as just a really old bone. It is actually, it's turned into a rock, isn't it? It's not like when you dig up, like, you know, when you regularly dig, dig up graveyards, what am I admitting to here? <laughs> yeah. <But> you know, <laughs> If you are, if you unearth human remains, uh, you know that are even a thousand years old, that they're not fossils; they're still just dry bits of bone. And there's a difference between that and what we're finding with dinosaurs. Pretty much, the definition of a fossil is something that has mineralized. So, yeah, our, the reason our bones preserve so well, of course, is they are already very heavy mineralized. But it is a biological mineral. Being... Is, is it calcium? Is that yes, calcium carbonate yeah. is the big one, and there's some other stuff in there too. Um, but that is a you know living biological tissue, and then then when those when organisms die that dries out and obviously bones are pretty robust and not a lot of things eat them which is why they survive well but yeah fossils are where those things have been buried and undergone a you know chemical and physical reaction under compression and buried deep in the earth and all the rest of it and they have become mineralized they have taken on the characteristics of the rock that they are in which is partly why they're also ran some so many random different colors for dinosaur bones because of all the different conditions ah uh, i just thought they just did that to pay um, so when they put them on display, I'm an idiot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's but, literally because they're different types of rock. Yeah, qu quite literally. And that's why they'll respond differently. And so some are relatively easy to get out of rock because they are much harder than the rocks that they are in. And some are very hard to get out because they are soft and the rocks are hard. But, oh, no. but it's worth stating that the you have literally turned the bone into stone, but it is a perfect copy. Uh, we talked last week about things like medullary bone. You can cut the bone up and polish it and look at it under microscope and look at the individual bone cells. Okay, so it's not just the shape. No, it's not some crude replica. It is literally the physical thing has turned into another thing. I mean, I guess a, a vague and imperfect analogy would be toasting a slice of bread. Um, you know, the outside still actually has all the same little bubbles and textures and the bubbles that you could see are still replicated, But and the fundamental thing is still the same, but it's now hard and crispy, whereas it used to be soft. 
Okay. Okay. I, I, I get you. I get it's you, an, I think. It's an imperfect analogy. It was the best thing I could think of at yeah. short notice. <laughs> Fair enough. So don't put marmalade on your fossils. That is the takeaway <laughs> from this episode. That, that, that's, the le- <laughs> that's the lesson of the day. Dinosaurs are all over the earth. I mean, yep. presumably there are only... Because it's not like every single dinosaur got turned into a fossil, is it? What, why are some fossilised and others not? Yeah, so our, our, our general rule of thumb, which frankly we have no idea how accurate it is, is that it's about a million to one. So for every living million living individuals, one might have become a fossil. Wow. And then, of course, we've actually got to go and find it at the other end. So that further limits our ability and cuts the numbers down. Um, but yeah, quite simply, you know, if you're a random animal wandering around and you die for whatever reason, there is a very good chance you'll be eaten uh, because you were killed by a predator. Um, But equally, even if you haven't been and you've been drowned or just die of starvation or you're ill, there is a very good chance that scavengers will get to you and then bacteria and flies and fungi and you will break down and dissolve and decay or erode. You know, the bone, the sun and wind and rain will get to the even the bones and take them apart, in which case no possible preservation. If you get buried because there's a sandstorm or you're in mud or you're in a river and then there's lots of silt in the river and you end up on the bend and whatever else. I love that. You end up on the bend. Geographer's listening. He means meander. I know things. Yes. Um, You can get buried. That stops things getting to you. That stops you decaying and has a chance of you being buried further and further and further and compressed and mineralized. And that's how you get your fossil. But yeah, these events are fundamentally very, very rare. But it's also why under the right conditions, suddenly they become very common. So things like volcanic eruptions tend to kill everything, including things like bacteria, which means you're far, far more likely to be buried than you would if you just Ah. out on the middle of a plane. I was going to say, the chances of getting buried and not having anything eat you is well, I'm trying to think of it and it, it would be it'd be really da- hard to do it because that does explain though why you get certain places being better than other places yeah. for fossils right if the conditions are right yeah so if Lyme Regis in the UK is the one I've been to uh, and that's pretty good for your little shells and ammonites and things it was a bay then lots of mud lots of silt and marine sediments are always good for this because animals that die sink to the bottom and are out of the region reach of many animals already automatically and then if there's loads of mud stirred around there's a very good chance you'll be buried but yeah these these patterns means we have some bizarre anomalies so if you go to a modern rainforest and a big even a big animal dies it will break down extremely quickly with the heat and humidity and all the stuff that's going on so actually even though modern tropical rainforests have huge numbers of animals you know vast diversity of life and huge numbers of life they're terrible for producing fossils deserts have very few species and very few individuals of those species but decay is almost non-existent because everything just dries out pretty much instantly so that means actually if you look at the fossil record our general knowledge of things like rainforests is awful because things don't fossilize there and our knowledge of deserts is amazing wow so we've got a really weird perspective yeah I and mean, of course we at least we know that so we can work on you know we know that those biases are almost certainly in place but it's weird that we have a really good understanding of desert habitats and desert species and a very poor understanding and a very poor knowledge of what were probably the most diverse areas but you guys seem to dig in areas which are already like deserts. Is that because they were deserts then and still are deserts now? Or So some are. So Mongolia and China, I spent a fair bit of time. I asked a senior paleontologist, a guy called Jim Clark at George Washington State, who's a brilliant researcher while I was out there, because he'd be Jim had been digging there for decades. I went, Jim, what did this look like 70 million years ago? And he kind of went like this um, <laughs> it was it was very dry there were few plants in places where there was water there was a lot of plant material but you know they, those were few and far between and th- yeah the environment there was probably not a lot different to what it was now other places that's that's not true at all but yeah there's a reason we go to desert and badlands and places like that and it's because not because they're necessarily good for fossils um, there are other places which are equally good or even better for the fossils but it's the places that we can get to them ah 
to get a good fossil, you want something that's still underground. You want to get it before it's been exposed and is being eroded. If you're in a place where there's deposition, like a floodplain, well, sediment is not going away. Sediment is increasing, so you never find anything. So you've got to go to a place where, ideally, sediments are eroding. Otherwise, you go back every year and never find anything new because nothing's changed. And where you can get to the ground. And that means places where there's not a lot of plant cover and, of course, not a lot of other things like human habitation. Um, and deserts and badlands, therefore, is lots of rock on the surface. Nothing grows there, so there's very little agriculture. No one lives there because there's very little agriculture. And there's lots of erosion happening because there's no plants and soil to protect the rocks. It's also presumably, you know, there's political reasons and funding issues as well as to why you go to certain areas and not others. But you've been to places like China, so that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, so I, I spent three years uh, at the IVPP, so that's the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. So I had three years there, and as a result of that, I went digging in sites all over China. I didn't get to dig very much. Um, I was there as a postdoctoral researcher, and while I did get to join various excavation teams, that wasn't really what they were paying me for, so they wanted me to spend my time working on stuff rather than digging holes. I love the way you're you're sounding like you're making excuses, but to me that is a bonus deal because oh, digging sounds hard. I know I'm mates with like I know a lot of very cool. Uh, no, <laughs> I know people. <laughs> I know people who are archaeologists. <laughs> Very cool archaeologists. It's an oxymoron. You can't say it. Uh, the cool archaeologist. But no, but the thing is, there are cheats you can do. Because the thing is, like, I'm thinking that you go off to some sort of site in China and it's this massive plain. And where on earth do you go dig to dig first? Because it's not like there's a little sign that says fossils here. And if you're an archaeologist, we got, you know, you can go into planes, you can do surveys, you can work out a straight line means human habitations. We love wolves. Everybody loves a good wall. So, you know, there are ways to get around it. How on earth do you pick where your dig sites are if you are a paleontologist? In general, knowing where things are. So obviously, you know, the, the world geologically has been mapped in a fair amount of detail because we're looking for various resources and minerals and we want to know what the soils are like and so on and so forth. You follow the oil and mineral companies. Yeah, to a degree, but we have mapped the world geologically at a fairly fine level. So it's not too hard to look at a map and go, okay, we know there's a big fossil bed here where we've dug before and found stuff, and it's covered by this and below this level. And over here, a couple of hundred miles away, is the same layer of rock with the same thing above it and the same thing below it. That's probably a good place to go digging. We should go and have a look. And so you would send a team out to have a look around just to see, have a look at the rocks, have a look at the stratigraphy and the layers, see what the type of preservation is. Maybe it's different. You know, even, you've got to remember, even paces away from one point to another could be the difference between a riverbed and a floodplain. And so the preservation could be different yards apart, even within a single fossil layer. There's different layers of rocks with different dinosaurs in each layer of rock almost because of the preservation. So it's almost like somebody's trodden on a trifle. So the layers have become mixed depending on where you are. Well, they've, they've, some bits are sticking up and some bits are lower down. And I mean, I'm really not a geologist because I came through a, a zoology background, but y yeah, you have not, not quite necessarily that with mixing things up, though stuff can get flipped over occasionally. Oh, yeah. But it's more like, you know, an absolutely enormous trifle and some bits have been dug out and that's because erosion has removed some of it and other places have been built up and the layers weren't laid down evenly in the first place because the sponge fingers or the or the fruit was patchy and so yeah you you've got to kind of reconstruct all these different places to try and layer out and, and work out where these things correlate with each other yeah let's say we get to a site and we know that there's likely to be dinosaurs here because you know there are layers yeah, that correspond right type, and geology right age, things yeah. says and you get there how do you know where to dig exactly when you get there? I mean, is there a, like a is there like an X ray gun where you can just go? Boop, 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 there's a dinosaur in the rocks over there. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, there's a big one over here. People have tried that stuff. So okay, want to avoid talking about it because it's already this podcast, but you can't avoid it. Jurassic Park, the start of the first film. <laughs> they're out digging and they got the big machine that goes thump and it does a like a you know sonar through the through the ground and it comes back and they go oh that that's the fossil. People have tried it. It basically doesn't work. <sighs> Because the short version is, as we've just discussed, so your bones have absorbed or are fundamentally very similar to the rock that they're in. And of course, what things like sonar are working off is differences. And so if your rock is an almost identical density to your bone, 
venues, there's no difference, and therefore there's no signal to pick up. So how do you find them then? So what do you do? You walk around. <laughs> Not, this is not sexy or exciting, Dave. It's, it's, it's extremely <laughs> non-technical. And the, but the thing, the thing to do is you, you walk around, in particular, you walk around valleys. So again, there's lots of erosion going on in these places. So there's all kinds of hills and valleys and stuff. And what you tend to do is you walk in the valleys because what's usually happening, of course, is that you're, hopefully your bones are at lots of different layers. If they're at one single layer, you would just walk along that layer and just look for anything. But mostly, you, you know, your, your layer is either very thick and they can be hundreds of meters thick or, you know, there's, there's just dinosaurs throughout in various different places. And so what you're actually looking for is little chunks of bone because a skeleton which has eroded already is falling apart it's exposed to the sun and wind and rain and plants and it's going to disintegrate or it already has disintegrated what you want is a skeleton that's still underground of course if it's completely underground you won't find it so what you really want is a couple of little bones sticking out of a cliff face or of course if they've eroded a little more than that they'll fall out of the cliff face and roll down the hill. So as you're walking down valleys, you're constantly scanning all the hillsides in the area and looking for bone that's coming out. And that, of course, takes a real eye because the it's often a very similar colour and a similar texture to the local rocks. Does anybody actually do that, though? Do you actually see a little bit of bone and go and find a dinosaur? Yeah, I've done it. And I was extremely oh! proud when I did it. And yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, seriously, it was a chunk... The size of my little fingernail, maybe even half the size of my little fingernail, just walked along, saw this dot, that looks like bone, went up a hill, it was bone, dug around it, it's not just a fragment on the surface, there's a bone going in behind it, dug behind that, and there's another bone, dug behind that, and there's another bone. This was a place in um, Xinjiang in northwest China. And there, when we get fossils, uh, it's, it's a very unusual environment. You you almost never find anything. Like we took a team of 25 people for three weeks and found like three things. But when you find something, it's almost inevitably a whole skeleton and often multiple skeletons together. Wow. Um, and in this case, it was a, a juvenile tyrannosaur that we got out. Really? Yeah, and a couple of turtle shells as well. Hang on. For the rest of us, is a turtle shell a type of dinosaur or is it just a couple of turtle shells that were just there? It's, it's a couple of turtles though i'm using turtle in the american sense they okay. were probably tortoises so land turtles um yeah. i'm used to dealing with american paleontologists where any tortoise terrapin and turtley thing is a turtle bizarre americans <laughs> uh, good thing there are no no americans <laughs> listening <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so you actually found so that that's that's amazing just from a little like yeah. dot yeah. You, just went, you could recognise dinosaur bone. How far away f- from the dot were you when you saw it first time? Oh, probably half a dozen yards. I mean, not far, but again, we're talking about a dot. Um, Still, eagle-eyed Dave. That's amazing. It's a combination of... Th- there is a skill to it because some people spot things that, are, you know, even a team of paleontologists have walked past and just go, no, there, you, you need to get that. Um, th- there, there is a skill to it, but there's also a certain amount of just effort. If, if you put enough people out and walk around and keep looking long enough, <laughs> you will find stuff. And also every year it'll change a bit because more of it will erode. So it's a constant changing. Yeah, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping to get into the field next year. So obviously we're on lockdown at the moment, pretty much worldwide. Uh, that's, you know... There are probably very few paleontologists getting into the field right now anywhere on Earth. And that means we're going to go an entire year with no one doing any exploration or any digging. Oh. Now, on the downside, that means we'll probably miss some things. And when we come back next year, stuff we might have found this year now will have been eroded or destroyed. But really, it means we'll have two full years of erosion before we go digging next year. And that greatly increases the chances of you finding something really special. Um, okay. So next year, so <laughs> fingers not crossed. All bad, not it. all bad news, we hope. Well, it's it's kind of swings around about, you know, on the, on the one side, you you're not looking on the other side there's a better chance of better exposures so you and your tyrannosaur so you were out were you walking alone or did you have a group of people ready with shovels obviously prospecting alone is dangerous in the absolute middle of nowhere so it's a very bad idea but equally having you know two experts stood next to each other is equally a waste of time <laughs> because you're just looking at the, the same stuff and spread your expertise yeah, yeah. but I, i've been out with i've been out with people and someone's literally stepped over something and the person behind them spotted it but you know on average it's not a great use so what you usually do is prospect in pairs but you just make sure you're in permanent eye line or you know a shout away just in case you know an accident happens so 
at that moment, I was completely alone. Um, but there was someone, you know, 20, 30 meters away, just looking on the other side of the valley. Okay. Um, so yeah, no, no, no chance of anyone nicking my credit. I found it. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't suggesting. So, but when you found it, so it was you two together, you obviously didn't excavate the entire thing at once. Yeah. So again, I, you know, I did a little bit of digging on my, you know, so I'm carrying a bunch of tools with me. I'm doing a little bit of digging because there is still the chance that it's what I, what I saw was bone, but it's just a fragment and there's nothing behind it or it's one bone or a couple of bones and nothing else so yeah i went digging for probably five ten minutes till i realized there was definitely two or three bones there what bones were they could you tell i'm pretty sure it was the foot i'm pretty sure they were okay. foot bones now your toes poking out <laughs> seven eight years ago uh, oh no probably long more like nine mm. um <gasps> uh so yeah so did that much and then immediately you know ran to the top of the nearest hill so i could find the nearest two or three people around yell wave over because as i say this is an area where mostly we don't find very much um mm-hmm. so i'm not i'm not interrupting everyone else's work dragged them over what do you think yeah we think it's that cool right let's get digging so then three four of us spent probably the rest of the afternoon clearing that away so there was about 15 18 of us on that dig but of course we're all scattered everywhere and so of course pretty much everyone goes back for lunch and goes back in the evening you don't want to just be chasing people all day you never get anything done um so yeah expose as much as you could realize there were we're now six seven eight bones at this point you've definitely got a good chunk of a skeleton here um went back to camp with some of course now you know with photos it makes so much easier you can just take a couple of photos and get a gps and then walk back to camp and just show your camera here found this oh great um uh, yeah and then the next day yeah probably half the team seven eight of us with a pneumatic drill with a portable generator portable in the loosest you know it takes four people to carry the damn thing you know basically (laughs) an engine block in a little housing you can see where they don't dig digs halfway up mountains people do and there is stuff excavated from mountains but it just gets so much harder as you know every time you factor in all these differences in this case you know we could drive a range rover to within about 100 yards of it and so even carrying this damn generator and the pneumatic drill up and down the hill it's not too bad when you've only got to go 100 yards but yeah then then obviously we just start going into the hillside and just clearing the hill out because obviously we now got to go in um and then when you start getting down to the bones you excavate around it so you obviously you're very careful because you don't want to smash anything up um and then that's when you cover it in plaster of paris like every single film and documentary and indeed like they were doing in the 1870s i think that kind of technique was developed and so that's to stop the bones from crumbling up yeah it's it's just to protect them. You're going to stick them in the back of a car and drive them a very, very long way. And they're probably going to go in the back of a, in a train or another one at some point. And at least some of this is going to be cross country. Then they might sit in a lab for a couple of years before you get to them. Yes, wow. Yeah. So just having something which protects everything and makes it safe and means that if you drop it, you don't ruin everything is a really good idea. And so do you do you do wrap each bone? I mean, it must take ages if you've got to wrap each bone individually. It varies. So I've, I've found found so the, probably my second greatest find was a little foot of an alvarosaur we talked about alvarosaurs last time the tiny little anteaters and this foot oh, yeah, is yeah, like yeah. the size of my thumb and it's like oh. all the li- all the little foot bones and all the little toe bones and the claws all together just sat and they it was an unusual preservation this is from inner mongolia so north central china um and basically it was just a foot with very little sand on it at all like something like a lucky rabbit's foot yeah almost almost a complete piece and so i literally found it picked it up wrapped it in a bunch of toilet paper put it in a cloth bag <laughs> and that that was the limit of work that ever was required to that fossil toilet paper dave you're not being romantic and adventurous with toilet paper yeah so so everyone carries reams of toilet paper in the field first of all for the obvious necessity when you're (laughs) miles from anywhere and secondly because exactly this you know it's really nice and soft and flexible and it's light to carry and you can wrap stuff in awkward shapes with it and pad them effectively um (laughs) so yeah everyone carries rolls of toilet paper everywhere and every every sooner or later every paleontologist will will face the dilemma of i've only got so much toilet paper and this fossil is valuable but i know i'm going to need some more paper soon (laughs) (laughs) and how much do you commit to the fossil (laughs) or other activities the paleontologists waver 
That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so you excavate your dinosaur and it gets put in the back. I mean, I can imagine something, you know, quite small being able to be transported. But if it's a massive, because some of these dinosaurs, you know, they're huge. How on earth do you get the bones out then? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's a big, if it's a big skeleton or if it's several skeletons together, I've excavated that before, a group of several on top of each other. And you don't want to break them up or lose that information of how were they orientated and which one was lying there and all the rest of it um then yeah you you ultimately left with the choice of either you take out a huge block or you've got to break things oh. um and, and, and that's the options um and taking out a huge block isn't always easy so yeah i took out a huge lump in china uh, it was several ankylosaurs or so the armored dinosaurs we had i think five of them together which is actually not that uncommon you tend to get these clusters of juveniles um and yeah we took out something like the size of a dining table it was like whoa you know six feet long and three foot wide and two foot high block of sandstone weighed an absolute ton we had to, we actually had to cut it in half in the end and basically go down the middle and veer around the bones and, and try not to break anything uh, but even then the way we got it out is happily we were not that far from the nearest small town and so we rented a bulldozer and literally <laughs> just drove the bulldozer out into the desert uh, and this, this it had been plastered up but just picked it up and put it on the back of a flatbed truck and then drove it to the train station and put it on a train. I can imagine a lot of people's hearts were racing when that yeah. picked it up. <laughs> but with, with other stuff, you don't have that option. So one thing you often see in, again, in documentaries, and this is particularly common in the US, is, again, Jurassic Park reference, where the whole skeleton is exposed on a hillside and there's paleontologists working all over it and, and opening up all the bones. Now, that obviously is normally a terrible idea because you want to be doing it in a lab under climate control and with glue to hand and air conditioning. And, you know, if someone drops a bloody hammer, they're going to break something. And of course, if it's on a table in a secure lab, that's not going to happen, etc. But a huge amount of the US stuff, even though, of course, it's it's licensed and permitted, you're on public land where it is very often so protected that you're not allowed to take wheeled vehicles. Oh, no. um, which means you have two choices, either carrying out by hand or getting a helicopter to take it out. And whichever of those two options you end up using, weight is unbelievably critical. So although they're doing what could be sort of a very suboptimal thing in terms of you know, removing a lot of the protection that you'd actually really like to keep, again, if that's the only way you're ever going to get it out, then that rock has got to go. And so they'll prepare it very heavily and far more than we would ever need to in China where those rules don't apply. Is that why, you know, American paleontologists just look so strong? Strong and dashing. Do we think that's why? It must be that. Well, you, you you end up carrying stuff no matter where you go and <laughs> digging a big hole in a hillside is a fair amount of effort. On the subject of really big things, um, again, you know, in the past that wasn't always easy either because people just didn't have to have the transport or the places were just awkward. Um, there's a famous location in um, Tanzania called Tendaguru, which in the 1930s was German East Africa and the Germans were doing some major excavations there and they were pulling out what we now call Giraffe Titan, which was called at the time Brachiosaurus. Um, and the big bones of those animals are two meters long and when mineralized are, you know, two, three hundred kilos. Um, and they had footpaths were the only things, you know, through the, through the mountains or, or at least through very rugged terrain to get them to the coast. Um, and so they were carried by hand. And that oh. meant that any large bone basically had to be deliberately, if it wasn't already, because often a lot of them are broken, deliberately broken into carryable chunks. Oh, no. And they would, you know, a femur that size would be broken into four or five pieces and then strapped with ropes onto a bamboo pole so that two or three people a could physically walk. just <laughs> walk it, oh. you know, 20, 30 miles out of the site to where they could get it onto a horse and cart or to a motor vehicle i'm just i mean I've, I've been watching better call saul on netflix and there's an episode where he has to walk through the desert for a bit and and carrying stuff and oh my goodness no spoilers here don't worry but oh just just the thought of it that's that's a lot of work okay so you've got your you got your bones back to but well, they're going to a museum i assume um generally yes <laughs> yes i'm just well, yeah i don't know if there's like a special like you know well first we have to take them to the dinosaur sensor the emergency room and make sure that they're not alive i don't know <laughs> So you take them to the museum and what happens to them then? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of stuff goes into storage um, because 
So again, productive places, so things like Inner Mongolia in China, we can find more stuff in six weeks than their preparation team can clear out in a year. Wow. So you tend to actually accumulate stuff. And in these plaster jackets, they are safe for decades, even potentially centuries. And, you know, fossil, I once wrote a somewhat joking blog post saying that all research money in the world should go into paleontology. <laughs> right, but anything we don't find and excavate and put into a museum museum and protect will erode and be destroyed and gone forever mm. yes obviously we want to save things like elephants but elephants can breed and produce more elephants fundamental chemical structures of things will be the same if we run the large hadron collider in 200 years or if we run it tomorrow that fossil will be gone and will never exist again if we don't collect it but that means that therefore our policy is even if there's stuff that we know we're not going to prepare or we pro- you know may not get to for decades if we don't collect it now it's gone and it's probably worth having so we better get it um and so yeah museum all museums tend to have a big backlog of stuff they really like to get round to but haven't yet because they've always found something more exciting in the interim yeah and there there are warehouses often of unprepared material Uh, i mean it's not like raiders of the lost ark you know of a warehouse that goes on forever but you know a very large building or a separate part of their storage facility will have a you know literally tons of material it's going to be very strange for future archaeologists they're going to be like, what on earth happened here? There are all of these yeah. dinosaurs and humans living to get no, okay. um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because they're not all put on display, are they? Either they're just yes, yeah. You know, like like any museum, you know, the, the really good stuff is on display because that's what people want to see, and it's easiest to communicate what it is about and what it shows and what it means and how we know that. But there's tons and tons and tons and tons behind the scenes which aren't on display, and often that rotates through for special exhibits or goes on loan. But you know, a huge amount of that is usually the scientific collection i have a question about how you extract the fossils from the stone do you do yeah, what they said do you still do what they said they did like when i was a kid which is use dentist drills were they just making that up no that's pretty much what we use really yeah um <laughs> doesn't that take ages though because like they're tiny dentist drills yeah they can well so we we have some bigger ones with you know nubs the size of pencils but ultimately they're they're doing the same job which is that you you want to be able to dig into something very very hard and of course in the case of tooth enamel it's extremely hard but you also want some real precision and delicacy um and so though that these are the tools we use. they're basically in the case of the dentist and us they're basically tiny pneumatic drills it it's a barrel with a needle point at the end and that point is either going in and out or usually just vibrating on the spot uh and then with a hose out the back which will go off to a big air compressor somewhere uh and you have bigger ones for you know bigger stuff and some even super fine ones if you're working on very delicate stuff when you're working on delicate stuff stuff do you do you pitch yourself at the dentist chair does it make you jump no no okay. that's a, I, I don't have to do that fortunately <laughs> it doesn't that that hasn't got into my head yet but thank you for placing that idea there that oh you're very welcome you're very well next time you're at the dentists just think of just think of dinosaur fossils <laughs> but, but but that is basically what we're doing and again huge variation you know fossils that are prepared on super thin slabs you know where you can just crack it and it pops out you often don't have to do very much sometimes the rock is very hard and the bone is very soft which makes life very difficult Um, but if you're working with something like sandstone or most mudstones and siltstones which of course are very common because that's exactly the kind of stuff that bury things yeah usually the bone is a lot stronger than the rock that it's in which is a good start Um, but the the very fact that you've got a bone in you know another structure actually gives it a natural plane of weakness so obviously while you do need to be careful and you don't want to break your delicate fossils in general if you hit it what actually happens is the rock will crack off around the bone and you're just trying to do that process in a very controlled and careful way okay so you're not actually going around whacking them is what you're saying you definitely don't do that uh, yeah so i mean because what i'm picturing now is um occasionally on these cooking shows you get people i'm going to salt bake my beetroot and they put the beetroot in the oven with a with a salt baked crust and then at the end of it they take it out and they whack it and all of the clay comes off and they're left with the cooked beetroot i mean it, it's not a million miles from that i mean there are videos you'll see online of what we, what we call concretions where where basically balls of rock form around fossils and if you just hit it with a hammer they generally crack and expose the fossil perfectly and that's precisely because it's that plane of weakness so that is where the rock is going to break and 
and just open it up and show you the fossil. Um, and yeah, for, for big things, I mean, we, obviously we need to be careful, but there is a trade-off. You, you cannot prepare something the size of a sauropod with a drill with a point that's, a, that's as fine as yeah. a propelling pencil. <laughs> so, of course, what we do is if, you know, I've got a big bone, um, the skeleton's roughly articulated, so I've got no reason to think that there's any bit of tail vertebrae or a spare tooth lying next to this bone. I can see where my bone starts. I'm currently sitting, you know, 15, 20 centimetres from that. Uh, it's not that I don't need to be careful, but I'm not sitting there with a tiny thing. That's when I can physically get out a real chisel and a hammer and I can knock off some huge chunks of rock a safe distance away from the bone very quickly and clear out a load of rubble. Like a cheating Michelangelo. Yeah, and the finer chisel as I get a bit closer and a finer chisel as I get a bit closer. And then when I'm down to the last centimetre or two, that's when I'll break out the dental tools. You have to have a good idea of what what it is you've got as well, I suppose. Then. Right, and and so that, and again, so that's where these things vary enormously. So an articulated skeleton, so it's in its natural position, you know, the fingers connected to the hand, the hand connected to the elbow, etc. Um, actually, that sounds slightly wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> you know, but right, but you know what's coming next in the series. You know, I've, I've prepared five fingers this is a five fingered dinosaur there really shouldn't be a sixth one i can go pretty quickly along here and the odds are i won't hit anything and that's fairly safe i've got a complicated joint but i know i'm at the back of the skull and i know that the next bit is probably going to be bulging out so i'm going to be super careful because i'm expecting a lump here so yeah n- but knowing what you've got makes a huge difference just jumping back a bit because earlier you said that you know you've come across dinosaurs where you've got multiple fossils all in the same place together and have all mm. been so how is that that happened have they all just been poisoned or something has why would they be like that yeah there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that so a, a common one yeah is that it's it was a group of dinosaurs trapped and killed together um we've got a number of different ones where they've got stuck in mud um and you can tell that from <laughs> how could you well because you know if that thing preserved in one go then you know we talked about footprints all that churning is still visible so you can see that although there's seven or eight skeletons here all the stuff around their legs is all horribly mixed up and it's all oh, no. settled out and that showed that it was very wet at the time that it happened and so, so they literally got stuck yeah so so we have some like that. There are a couple of examples where we think they literally did get poisoned. Really? You can get toxic pools and toxic water if you get these weird algal blooms, or if an animal dies of some horrible septicemia, a predator comes along and eats that. The toxins might be enough to kill it within minutes, and then of course a predator will come along and try and eat that. Um, and- oh wow! So like you got a predator poisoning your predator, and they all sort of like eat each other in a chain of death. Yeah, and they're called predator traps, and a, a, the, perhaps the most famous one is La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, where you know normally for a normal ecosystem, big predators are pretty rare and big herbivores are pretty common. Um, at La Brea, they've pulled out literally hundreds of dire wolves and dozens of saber-toothed tigers um, for a handful of deer and antelope and and hundreds of birds and particular things like vultures and condors and that's because of exactly this situation you know you know something like a deer gets trapped it's in the tar it can't get out it's either dead and smelly or it's alive and making lots of distressed noises and of course every predator under the sun will go free meal wander over walk into the tar get stuck dies free meal predator walks over gets stuck free meal (laughs) and you end up with literally hundreds of carnivores in buried in tar but we have dinosaur ones like that too so wusai one so where i found my tyrannosaur the the reason that we suspected that there was probably a whole skeleton there before we'd even started digging is it's famous for having very few fossils but when you find them there's a load of them together okay and the interpretation of this this is some super Superb work um, done by a guy called Dave Ebeth, or led by Dave Ebeth, uh, who's in Alberta, is that basically you can imagine a very muddy, you know, lakeshore or similar, and big dinosaurs, so big 30, 40 ton sauropods are walking through here. And again, you, we see the mud has been churned up in columns, and those columns kind of alternate. Oh my God, they're footprints. Which is exactly what you'd expect from, yeah, if, effectively. 
footprints that have you know gone down the weight of the animal has squidged all the mud out Mm -hmm. and then sucked it back up as it steps out and then all the water churns and you basically get this kind of weird liquefaction of the mud and so of course wherever that happens it's now super sticky um and very easy to get stuck in and so you can imagine a small animal walking along or a small group of animals walking along together way down into this it doesn't look different to everything else and suddenly they're stuck and then, of course, distress calls, Ond or die, other things come along, they get stuck, and so on and so forth. And so out in Wusou 1, you often find very, very little, because, of course, it was very unusual for these things to form and animals to get mm. stuck in them. But when you do, There's loads. finding four, five, six, seven dinosaurs and other things like local crocodiles and turtles and other stuff, all in one just vertical <sighs> column. Has anybody actually gone in and sort of like... Pretty normal. Like done a sort of core sample of this column. So you just you just get an entire column well, out. So, so these were discovered before I started working out there. But my understanding is, yeah, this is basically what happened is they found some, they found a couple of skeletons together, obviously absolutely ecstatic started digging them out and as you start to lift them off there's another one underneath oh, wow. and then you go down to that one and there's another one under that one and then at this point you start to become very suspicious oh. that you've basically found nothing for weeks and then five on top of each other it's like the past the parcel of dinosaurs this is amazing with a sweetie every layer <laughs> yeah and in the end they they dug out this block that was something like two meters high Whoa. which of course is not the way you normally excavate <laughs> fossils no oh that's great to get the depth depth to capture everything and then of course that also meant you could see all the different layers and what had gone on oh, i wish we could display something like that in a museum i mean let's let's talk about museums because presumably once you've done all the preparation and if it's a new species presumably you've described the dinosaur and said well it's it was very large but technically that's I mean, something i really want to talk about in the future is like you know how do we name them why do we know that they're different species and how do we differentiate between species and all that stuff we've oh, well, well, We'll run out of episode time. This is the thing. Uh- <laughs> no, I, said, I said another time, but we, we must cover that. Um, not all fossils go into the museum so how do they and because not all you know dinosaur fossils are complete so how do they decide what goes into a museum and what doesn't yeah well well, in terms of display um again it sort of depends what you're doing so places like the royal tyrrell museum in alberta which is absolutely phenomenal that's partly built where it is because of the huge collection of local dinosaurs and therefore you know over half their exhibition space of the entire museum is devoted to local alberta dinosaurs which is fully understandable in the uk we don't have so many so perhaps it's not a big surprise that there's not <laughs> tons of we've got a copy um, of dippy <laughs> we yeah we you know, but, you know but we haven't filled it with british dinosaurs and then again you know not even originals like you know every single museum worth its salt wants a t-rex and ideally wants a real one but there's only so many to go around so yeah a lot of stuff is casts um so replicas and then and people say oh well, it's a fake it's, it's not a fake you've made a mold and taken a copy so it is an exact replica it's just not the, obviously the true original bone um but even you know very good and mostly complete skeletons they're never totally complete you know some ribs are missing the tip of the tail is missing a couple of bones of the hand are missing um, and so those need to be replaced to make the thing look complete. And those are either cast from um, others of the same species, if possible. Who are the same size as well, presumably. Yeah, we have got lots of T-Rexes, so we can get some extra ribs from another one and make copies of them and slot them in. Or you can physically sculpt them if they're very simple bones. Best, the best, the best job ever. Yeah, you can make copies from your own thing. You know, if it's missing a couple of teeth, well, copy the tooth in front and stick it in the socket behind. Occasionally, they get lumped together. So this was, again, much more common in the past where people were much more interested in these as display items rather than as for scientific... You know, they were done for the you know for the greater glory, basically. There's this giant-mounted giraffe titan in the Humboldt Museum in Berlin, which is absolutely stunning. And it's four or five animals welded together yeah. because they never found a complete skeleton. Please tell me they called it Frankenstein. <laughs> no, but they, but they but they had enough to be able to make it. So although there's some casts and sculpts and bits in there, like the neck is from one animal and then the front leg is from one animal and the back leg is from another animal and the tail's from two other ones. Um, and so three quarters of it is original bone, but it's also not one individual. I've got to see this thing because I've never seen... 
because uh, I, I know them as Brachiosaurus. So what are they called now? Giraffe Titan. So the Titanic giraffe. It's an absolute horrible name, but wow, well, I don't know Giraffe Titan. That's, I, I'm not. I'm not too. I'm not too bothered by that. But I, I have to because it's one of you know my bugbears with a lot of these dinosaurs is you don't really you know you're not really like we were talking with Triceratops and most people I included think they were the size of rhinos and they weren't. They were much yeah. bigger. So. Yeah, I mean, if you could put on a display in a museum, what would you put on? You know, if you had an unlimited budget and you could say, "Look, you're in, you're in your exhibition spaces for three weeks. Go, what what do you build?" You'd be hard pushed not to include a Tyrannosaurus because even though oh, for so anyone cliche. who loves dinosaurs, yeah, they're a horrible cliche and ultimately passe. Um, a, I work on Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> and so I kind of want one. Um, and B, it it is you know, if you want one thing that you know people will come to see. And if you're running an exhibition and you want to teach them about things, getting them through the door is the first step of that, then you you probably want to include one. But yeah, even though I do very little on sauropods in general, the big sauropods, and again, like we say, you know, Diplodocus, which many people have seen, and not just in the UK, because there's copies of them all over Europe and in Japan and in Russia, US and, and other places too. Diplodocus is distinctly medium sized at best. Um, it doesn't come close to being a big sauropod. Sauropod. And so, yeah, one of the absolute titans um, is what you really want. Yeah. I also want to make a request that you have it so that there's like a trench around it so that people can't touch it, but they're on the same level. Because all of the scaffolding usually raises all the dinosaurs up and you don't really get that effect of how big... Because we just don't get that scale thing. Yeah, it's it, it's really annoying. So I, I have this... I was going to say, I have this theory, which is then one of those horribly colloquial things which annoy scientists... I have this idea that people are often very bad judges of the sizes of large things, in part because they have no frame of reference. So I've worked at London Zoo as a zookeeper for a while, and it's only when you physically stand next to, and by which I mean like six inches from a giraffe or a rhino or something, that you discover just how ludicrously big they are. <laughs> They don't look it. And I think it's because normally, you know, the member of the public, you, the, you know, the, the, the animal is somewhere within its enclosure and you are somewhere behind a fence or a moat or both. There's no car and there's no telegraph, telegraph, um, a telephone pole or street light or something that you know the exact size Shopping of that you're trolley. intimately familiar with. Yeah, right next to it. And museums have that same problem. You might only be a couple of metres away from a T-Rex skeleton, but two metres away when you don't know how big it is, and then as you say, it's raised off the ground, actually really distorts how large it is. And again, the head will then be four metres off yeah. the ground, and that's re and then you're looking up underneath it. You, it really warps people's perceptions of these things. So how would you display it then? So Fukui in Japan have done one thing which solves it. So they, they've got several T-Rex skeletons on display. Oh, Show-offs. Yeah, I know. And as a result, one of them they have basically in its own little side room and it's just got this giant, well, square spiral staircase. So there's just kind of ramp that just slowly goes up all the way around it in a spiral. So of course, if you stand even a yard away from the T-Rex, you can barely see it because there's all this metal gantry in the way. But that's not the point. The point is that you can walk all the way around it. You can even get on top of it and look down on it. And at no point are you more than pretty much an arm's length away from this skeleton. Indeed, actually, this is a cast. But in terms of the perspective, yeah, you can get head height. You can be eye to eye with the skull from a metre away. Then you appreciate that, oh my God, I could probably barely get my arms around this thing end to end. <laughs> at which you cannot do when you're standing on the floor and it's up in the air well above you. See, I've got in my head now that it would be amazing to have that, to have the skeleton one like you've got. And then next to that, have one which is animated to look like it's just resting and it's breathing and you can hear the noise of the animal and maybe feel a bit of heat off it and have a look at its feathers because little feathers. It's it's lovely when people do stuff like that. So um, the National Museum of Natural History in Tokyo regularly do special exhibits and I was there once where they did one. Um, and they'd mounted their T-Rex as if it was lying down on the ground, which, of course, you've never seen before because everyone yeah. always mounts them standing up 
and leaning over something and with a roaring, which I understand why, but it's so nice to see them in this completely different way. And it does change your perspective because people don't think of them like that. Oh, having a snooze. Well, I tell you what, I tell you what, if if one day we get enough, a big enough budget to put on our own exhibition, um, I think we better work out where's the best place to get the fossils. Now, fortunately, I don't need to ask you this question because we have a guest on the show who is magnificent, Dan Schreiber. Now, Dan um, does the podcast, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, called No Such Thing as a Fish. He is a QI elf. He is obviously a nerd about dinosaurs as well. And so he is here to ask you a fossil-based question. I'm not going to even ask if you like dinosaurs. Surely you must. I loved, of course I love dinosaurs. <laughs> of course, of course so. yeah. Now, do you have a question that you've always wanted to know that you could ask Dave? Yeah, so my question is, uh, the very first ever dinosaur bone, the sort of patient zero of dinosaur bones, is a bone that's called scrotum humanum. And this was discovered back in the 1600s. It was a drawing done of it by a guy called Robert Plot. Um, who didn't know what a dinosaur was because we hadn't discovered them then. Um, they didn't exist. They, they obviously existed millions and millions of years ago, but he, you know, no one knew that. There was a big gap, right? So when he found this bone, he didn't know to say this is a dinosaur. Instead, what he thought was it was a biblical giant, part of the body of a biblical giant. And um, the bit he thought it was, because it looked like it, was the uh, scrotum. Um, and then a hundred or so years later, another scientist, uh, Richard Brooks, then gave it officially the name based on the drawing, uh, Scrotum Humanum. Now, this bone has since, a hundred years after that, virtually, was rediscovered by William Buckland, who realized that it was a dinosaur bone and it became the Megalosaurus. So my question is, this is a very important bone, but it's missing. So my question is, how did you guys lose it? Where is it? <laughs> and is anyone looking for it? Um, have you checked your how did you How did you guys lose it? It sort of implies that I might have had something to do with a specimen. It's your field. I feel like you missing. all are culpable for this. <laughs> yes. Um, since it's missing, the answer, where is it, I don't know. <laughs> um, and is anyone looking for it? Probably not directly. Um, I don't know much about the specimen. As you say, it, um, I believe it turned out to be a megalosaur distal femur, so the lower end of the thigh bone most dinosaurs do have have a big pair of rounded ball-shaped joints for the knee so you can see where the name came from but yeah the the sad truth is lots of various historical specimens have gone missing for various reasons mm. uh, museums didn't necessarily document things museums didn't even necessarily exist in in the way in which we consider them now stuff gets lost stuff goes missing people steal things unfortunately and even specimens just disintegrate um, right. That's very unlikely in this case because if it is a megalosaur, it's um, going to be, and it's British, we don't usually have those kinds of problems. But there's whole bunches of bones from the mid -US, Midwest US and from China whereby once you bring bones out of the ground and they're exposed to air, their chemical composition can change quite quickly and they can basically disintegrate very, very fast. And there are specimens which have people have gone back to a shelf and the thing's basically crumbled. Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, things don't always survive and museum documentation now isn't as good as we'd like and we don't even necessarily know where everything is for a given museum, let alone something that's thick end of 300 years old. So is there, a, is there a thing where dinosaur bone hunters go out in the world to, say, Mongolia, and they, they look for eggs and so on, and you can read great accounts of people doing that these days, but are there dinosaur bone hunters who go into the back rooms of the museums to rediscover all the lost bones within the buildings? <laughs> so agrophobic dinosaur hunters. <laughs> not, not usually. Um, so what, what you will find is that Museums will periodically try and survey their collections to check on things like this. But mostly the problem is not so much that we've lost documented stuff like that, though it does happen, but often that we've got stuff that we, we don't even know what we have. So you've got people like Cope and Marsh, the famous um, paleontologists from the US from the 1870s who were in this massive war, and they just collected and bought absolutely everything they could and shoved it in a basement and never looked at it. Mm -hmm. People are still going through that stuff now because 
they bought literally thousands of tons of material between them. And it takes a while to process. Yes. That. We've all got that cupboard or that bit of the attic that we all want to clear out and sort or the garage or the shed. Try doing that with a century's worth of undocumented collections when, you know, individual specimens might weigh a quarter of a ton. It takes a while. That's so cool. I find it very <laughs> odd that, you know, you know, something's been in the ground for years and years and years and you take it out the ground and it crumbles. Yeah, it's because while as long as it's in particular what the problem we have is water, things that are underground, they're not, they're not exposed to air. In particular, they're not exposed to moisture in the air. So the rocks themselves might be fairly waterproof or very good at draining water or just fundamentally be underground and avoid getting soaked very much. But when you bring things up, the bones become instantly very fragile. And bones take on a lot of the characteristics of the rock they're in because that's where some of their mineral content came from. But they're still chemically distinct, which in some cases allows us to do cool things like dip them in acid and the rock man magically vanishes and the bone stays perfect, and you can get tiny, fragile bones out like this, which is amazing, which you can never prepare by any other means. But the flip side is also true, where sometimes the bones are much more fragile or chemically respondent to things you don't want them to be, like water, and then you start getting these decay problems. That's sad. Mm -hmm. Fizzy. It reminds me, though, of those um, bath bombs that have, like, you know toy dinosaurs inside that you can put in the bath and they fizz. That's actually science. <laughs> yes. yes. We'll, we'll go with yes. <laughs> Question two is um, I love collecting things. One thing I don't have is a dinosaur bone. So I was just curious, is there any great place where you can get ethically sourced dinosaur bone and for anyone else listening where they can go to to, to buy dinosaurs to have in their house? There's a huge amount to unpack there because the fossil collecting laws vary massively from country to country and even within countries. So Germany, for example, uh, Bavaria has very different collecting laws and ownership laws to the rest of Germany, uh, which then becomes very awkward when you're talking about where things come from and what they can do. Um, in the UK, at least, uh, if you find something on public land that is a fossil, you can pick it up and you can keep it and do what you want with it. So the obvious place for this is Triassic Coast, so bits of Dorset in particular and Lyme Regis and that area. And there you get even more complications because it's a World Heritage Site. So there you are not allowed to dig in the cliff face because that is protected and that's where the bones are coming out of. But stuff that has fallen out of the cliff face onto the beach, you can pick up. Mm. Go go down to Lyme Regis and look. The problem is dinosaurs are really rare in Lyme Regis because actually mostly what they produce are marine sediments. And the odd dinosaur fell in the sea, but they're very, very, very few and far between. You can get coprolite there because I bought some at a gift shop, but I've been down, I've got anamites and... Yeah, ammonite, belemnite, ichthyosaur vertebrae, fish vertebrae, fish teeth, shark spines. What are those little bullets, bullet ones? What are they called? Belemnites are the little no, I've got bullet bite things. Yeah, so, you know, these things are, are trivial. Dinosaurs, much, much trickier. And then similarly, in terms of purchasing stuff, it just depends on what the laws are. So China, Mongolia, for example, it's basically illegal to even collect anything without a permit, and only the government and, by extension, museums and universities can own stuff, and it's illegal to export anything. Whereas in the US, if it's on public land, it's owned by the government, but if it's on private land, it's owned by you. So there are people who own chunks of places like Montana, where there's loads and loads of farmland. People have had this land for centuries before they knew there were dinosaurs on it. Um, and paleontologists or dealers will go out, collect stuff in agreement with the owner, and then sell it. And that is absolutely 100% legal. The question then becomes, as myself as a professional paleontologist, is how ethical is that? Mm. Um, and there is a huge row or ongoing debate, let's say, uh, between various different factions. And obviously some people think that absolutely every single specimen should be protected and preserved. Some people think that absolutely anything should go and let's be free market about it. I sit somewhere between the two. Yes, there are extremely valuable and important scientific specimens that can tell us a huge amount about dinosaurs, which are in private hands. We can't study them as scientists because we don't have access or we can't guarantee access and we can't afford to buy them. Um, on the other hand, I've been to many, many sites around the world where, you know, 
little fragments of bone are just eroding out of the hillside, which are scientifically meaningless and useless. Uh, and even whole little bones, you know, things like the duckbill dinosaurs, we have them in the thousands and they shed, you know, tail vertebrae get busted up and fall out and their teeth fall out by the million in places. I personally don't see the problem with those being found, bought, sold, traded, because scientists would do nothing with them. And the rare things that you can do, you can actually do some really interesting thing with teeth, but you can go and get your own trivially anyway. You know, if I wanted a thousand teeth, I could go out and get them in a couple of weeks. So I don't mind if other people are buying and selling them. Yeah. So you can ethically buy stuff online in the uk you can go and ethically find and collect stuff but personally i would be very careful about where the original thing has come from and what those laws are um and i would look towards stuff which we know is super common and not valuable um so things like small chunks of bone which obviously you can't tell exactly what it came from you know there's going to be no scientific value attached to that or teeth of some animals which are extremely common very cool but we could we could write a tv series a bit like breaking bad but instead of drug dealers have it with you know people selling fossils that's that exists i know it's um, quite scary i'm joking about <laughs> it but i'm just like oh actually <laughs> but that's the thing that there's been major court cases and Lots of skullduggery going on, and then you know the the legality I know, I know. You getting into. You just used the word skullduggery when talking about <laughs> the fossil. Yes, no, no pun intended. <laughs> but yeah, you know the the legal issues over these. So you know Mongolia. So it's illegal to collect stuff in Mongolia. It's illegal to sell or export stuff from Mongolia. But as far as the US is concerned, if it makes it onto US soil, it's kosher. And so there's stuff which we know has been collected and exported from Mongolia because it's a species only known from Mongolia in Mongolian rocks or rocks that are only known from Mongolia. But technically, once it's in the US, it's legally available to sell. It might be at one level legal, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's ethical. So Mm. avoid Mongolia, Dan. Yeah, that's a shame. That's where I was going. Yeah, Mongolia, China, Brazil are the countries with some of the tightest laws but who are most exploited because of this loophole of once they're out the country, a lot of places don't care. How do they get There's Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I was going too rude. I was going to say something very rude. <laughs> how, how do they get it out? I, I, think, I think the same as a lot of this stuff is that, you know, no, you know, port authorities are not checking every single shipping container, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, as with the wildlife trade. Um, you know, you cannot expect the average customs inspector at either end to recognise the difference between certain chunks of rock and certain valuable fossils. Mm. Um, and so people will look at it and just not even realise what it is or not realise that it's valuable. You know, I, I don't think... I, I, a friend of mine is a customs or it used to be a customs inspector. And yeah, they get absolutely zero training in this. And I even asked them, I even asked her about fossil export and import laws in the UK and she didn't know and asked her friends and we went through some books together and some legal sources and we couldn't find anything on record. Wow. Um, there wow. probably are some laws on the books, but we couldn't find them and she hadn't been trained in them and no one she knew knew anything about them. So even if they stop a guy at Dover coming over from Calais with a boot full of stuff, even if they realised that they were fossils, would they have any reason to question... Mm. him bringing them in yeah and he and even if he and if he just went oh well i bought them in france and that's part of the eu they'd probably go oh okay when they're not they're illegally exported ultimately from brazil or from bavaria or who knows where what a shame they're not trained in that as custom officers that would be such a um a lure for advertising if you wanted to do recruitment to be like come come be a custom officer today you will be trained to look at dinosaur bones and become an expert in identifying legally sourced fossils from mongolia like that'd just be so cool tomorrow we're looking at uh, ancient oaks that shouldn't be allowed out of this certain forest like wow that would be the coolest job ever Get on it, customs. If anyone's listening. I've only got stuff... um, I know that's not true. I have a piece of coprolite that I bought when I was nine years old. That's what I have in my Mm. house at the moment. That's That and all the stuff I found in Lyme Regis is the only thing I've got. That's the only vague... What do you call that? A trace fossil. Yeah, coprolites are also trace fossils because, yeah, Yeah. it's it's something produced by a living animal that is not a living part of of animal. I'm kind of imagining that you've, like, got pockets of all the stuff that you've, like, picked up from various finds. Do you live in a sort of cave of stone no no um i've got 
Yeah, I've, I mean, I've got boxes and boxes of casts that I use for education and outreach stuff. Um, so, yeah, loads and loads and loads and loads like that. Um, in terms of actual fossils, no, very little. I've got some, yeah, ammonites and belemnites that I've picked up at Lyme Regis, including as a, a child and a few more recent ammonites I picked up quite a while ago. I've got a fragment of dinosaur bone because it says dinosaur bone on it that I bought at the Natural History Museum in London when I was, <laughs> I think, about six or seven. And I'm quite Aww. amazed that I still have it. Um, it's it's a piece of, I can't even see what it is it's just a rubbish polished fragment and a couple of other similar frags that you know people have given me and yeah they're indeterminate fragments that could be absolutely anything so they're definitely T-Rex then yeah that's, that's yeah let's yeah. call it that yeah exactly <laughs> all right then well um, we have to remind everybody that this is your last chance oh thank you very much for all the dinosaur pictures you can have a look at those on our Facebook page so find us on Facebook for that uh, so you can see everybody else is stuff and um it's it's our final show in this series next week and we are going to be answering your questions so do remember to give us an email all the details are at the end of the show so until next week (laughs) thank you for listening to the terrible lizards podcast do you have a dinosaur question for dave email terrible lizards pod at gmail.com and we'll answer it in a future episode To support the show, please leave a review on your podcast app and tell your friends about it. To find out more about us and to donate, visit terriblelizards.co.uk. Are you a dinosaur fan? Let us know. Follow Izzy Lawrence and Dave Hone on Twitter. That's at I-S-Z-I-L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at Dave Hone, D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. Include the hashtag TerribleLizards. Find us on Facebook at Terrible Lizards Podcast. We'll see you next time.